Good afternoon, Minecrafters, and welcome to Season 2. The total episodes here are 52. That means with 52 weeks in a year, we just hit the one-year anniversary mark for the Minecraft podcast. So today is a special day. So get ready to discuss the amazing ADHD mind, which we will rename. So, right out of the gate here, I'm going to start with a big rename on ADHD, which I also uh, did a, I did a, actually a TED Talk on in uh, New Hampshire just a little over a year, a year and a half ago, I guess, at this point. And I guess, apparently, the more I read and read and read about ADHD and what I'm, you know, there are, there are lots of people, especially those of us who have it, that uh, find it a complete misnomer. And in need of, you know, how they say, like a facelift, right? So, I mean, first of all, you know, the attention part, okay. If anybody who has it or lives with anyone who has this wild and wonderful difference in wiring knows that there is anything but a deficit of attention. I mean, it's just so ridiculous that it is named that. And so the... uh, the D, instead of deficit, we're going to say surplus because in, instead of paying attention to nothing, we're sort of paying attention to everything. And since the brain can, can only pay attention to one thing at a time, even if it's milliseconds, this is exactly how our wild and wonderful mind works. It's just this quick shift of attention, just, you know, like picture the mind, you know, it's, it's like one big gerbil on crack. And the other thing is the hyperactive part. So, of course, some people have the attentional type rather than, uh, you know, or they say the inattentional type versus the impulsive type. And some of us have been lucky enough to be blessed with both. And I know at a fabulous 56, and I don't know that it's, um, you know, a nice thing to even be, you know, 12 and want to be called hyperactive or just hyper. Sometimes people just shorten and call you hyper. They talk about your hyperness. You know, it's much better, I think, to say high energy. So, because when I, when I picture somebody hyper, so-and-so so hyper, I picture this, you know, just pain in the ass, you know, somebody who kind of has chaotic energy and, you know, just sucking the life out of the room kind of thing, which is really the opposite of how most of us are. High energy, we're very high energy and people often, you know, like, it's, okay, we say high energy, I think of somebody bouncing into yoga pants, very positive, you know, kind of giving people a lift just when they walk in the room. It's a much, it's a much, much better word. And, you know, another thing is that many people confuse what they label as our hyperness, hyperactivity, whatever, which is really us being high energy. People can confuse high energy with anxious or chaotic or high strung, uptight. Um, one thing those of us with ADHD are not is uptight for the most part. And obviously when we label and categorize and put people in boxes, it's, it's going to have a different face with every single person who has it because we're all snowflakes, whether we're neurotypical or on the autism spectrum or ADHD or, or whatever, we're all, you know, going to look different though, you know, in general, our minds are all kind of too over, all over the place to be uptight. So the high energy is just that it's a lot of energy. Okay, so, so far, instead of ADHD, so far we have attention. We'll keep that because that is what we're talking about, executive functioning, right? So attention, surplus, high energy. And instead of disorder, you know, I just, I will ask, I would like to ask all of you out there, if possible, to just delete that right out of uh, whatever language is, is native to you and any others you've learned. Just delete the word disorder because you'll be doing the whole world a favor. And I'm sort of on an anti-shame campaign myself. And the word disorder is just, that just needs to go. Uh, it's, it's a shame word. I mean, it means disorder means, you know, defective, flawed, not enough. You know, it's just, it, it, and that's how it has people feeling because it's just how it works that whatever comes after the words, I am, becomes true for us, right? So if we say, I am exhausted, guess how you're going to feel, right? I am, blah, 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 blah. That is how you're going to feel. And when we are hearing 
that we have a disorder, well, that's how we're going to feel. We're going to feel that we are flawed and defective, not as good as other people. I mean, who really needs that? You know, and this is also true in general. So our, our particular discussion today is about ADHD. And even though we're renaming it, I'll just probably stay consistent so we know what we're talking about. Um, but this shame thing is true with whatever somebody has. And so if you fill in the blank with the autism spectrum, you know, anxiety, depression, addiction, bipolar, whatever, okay, it's not the anxiety, depression, or bipolar, or whatever that kills us. It just isn't. It's the underlying feelings of shame, which are the feelings that we are damaged goods. That is what kills us. The feelings of, of being flawed and defective, not measuring up, that is what truly kills us. And that is not different with the ADHDers, or I like to say is the fast mind club. You know, and another very cool thing about uh, we neurodiverse thinkers is that typically, um, you know, when somebody's got something extra to deal with in life, so again, fill in the blank with what maybe you or somebody you, you live with and love or whatever has, when somebody has ADHD, you say anxiety, depression, bipolar, the autism spectrum, whatever, when we, when we have something extra to deal with, typically we shine in another way, in a way, and, and usually magnified from, um, from the neurotypical population. You know, so when somebody's blessed with any of these things, ADHD or the autism spectrum or whatever, there's a gift is what I'm telling you because it's just how it works. So even though we have lots and lots of challenges with our executive functioning, which is, you know, gets us through the day. So we, and yeah, this is challenging sometimes. This is, this is challenging. And yet what's very cool is that uh, it's, it's kind of like, you know, that closing the door open and opening the window thing. And, and one of the big, huge gifts of, of the Fast Mind Club is our insane ability for creativity and innovation. And this is because our mind wanders more than, more than neurotypicals. The brain in general is wired to wander, but the ADHD crew is just, we're all over the place. So um, what is, what's our detriment? Because it also trips us up a lot in school and at work because we miss things because our mind's all over the place. I, this is also the way that, you know, novels are written and, and movies are made and, um, you know, uh, businesses are started and, and become enormously successful. So that's one big gift that the Fast Mind Club, you know, has to offer the world. So as you may guess, I certainly, well, I read voraciously anyway, but I've really, in my midlife years, I've really begun to educate myself on, you know, you know how, how my brain works and, and you know, just uh, my fabulous brain, which I had to come into that place because it also wreaked havoc for, you know, three quarters of my life. I've known since I was 18, but then I just kind of dismissed it because especially it uh, back then, say back in the day, and it's kind of uh, instantly uh, sounds strange. Well, I don't want to say old because old is like not that nice of a word. We'll say season. But back then, especially as a young woman, girl, young woman, 18, you know, back then, you know, the only people at ADHD were, you know, you know, were like the dentist, the menaces, as far as the world was concerned, right? If you were female, you didn't even, they didn't even catch on for the most part. And if I was fortunate enough that um, it, at St. Mike's in college that um, my then counselor f figured it out. But, but, and from there though, nothing really happened with it. And so, you know, I, managing money was a complete disaster. I think I'm going to get more into that in the next podcast episode, but uh, and also a lot of fun was had because the, the ADHD years are generally pretty fun since we're, you know, kind of live in the moment kind of people. And uh, especially those of us who are impulsivity is our number one symptom. I actually have all of them. I don't know. Probably, actually, no, all but one. I don't have procrastination. And, you know, the, the diagnostic criteria can also be confusing for people who are just coming into it. You know, those who are younger, I think, have a lot more, obviously, have a not, lot more resources out there. There's obviously also a lot more of a knowledge base about differences in general 
and with the executive functioning system and all that, those of us though who are midlifers or or older, in fact, I was reading through um, the comments just this morning or earlier today on on that TED talk that I did a year and a half ago, and there was somebody on there, a woman who was seventy four, and she had just been diagnosed about ten years prior, and wow, you know, it, to finally make sense of things, you know, way after the fact is wonderful. And also, I know for myself, it can be frustrating. Because even though I knew nothing, can no treatment, nothing happened. I didn't take it seriously because no one else did kind of thing. And so you look back and think, oh, my gosh, this, just there was so much unnecessary suffering. And that can be, that can be tough when you don't understand it till later. And so anyway, I do a lot of reading. And Tom Brown's amazing. I was at a conference with him. And Ed Holloway's another one. And I was just reading... Um, William Dodson stuff. And, and I like how he said he was just kind of I'm say on a mission, but he was really excited to just kind of, you know, not get into all the diagnostic stuff is also confusing, but to zoom in on um, something that like the feature that everyone has with ADHD, basically, and that neuro, neurotypical people don't have. And then in his article, he wrote, he writes for uh, ADD attitude, which is a really cool magazine. And he writes, I found it. It is the ADHD nervous system, a unique and special creation that regulates attention and emotions in different ways than the nervous system in those without the condition. And You know, I also liked uh, reading in in his article that uh, he, he was totally on board with the renaming this. And he writes, uh, the ADHD zone, almost every one of my patients wants to drop the term attention deficit hyperactivity disorder because it describes the opposite of what they experience every moment of their lives. I said that, right? I've been saying this for years. Even before I did my talk a year and a half ago, I would go and speak at different things. And I probably, for at least 20, probably 15 to 20 years, I would say I've been saying that. And then he says, He says, um, it's hard to call something a disorder when it imparts many positives. ADHD is not a damaged or defective nervous system. It is a nervous system that works well using its own set of rules. Amen, Brother Dodson. So before I keep going here, let's state the full name. Okay, so William Dodson's article is entitled Secrets of the ADHD Brain why we think, act, and feel the way we do. Um, well, he, and then he says, what you don't know about ADHD could change your life. And he writes for, excuse me, again, for AD, ADD Etude Magazine, which is very, obviously, I'm a subscriber. It's really, really good and just has, it's a great resource. Okay, so then William goes on to say, he's uh, under his ADHD zone kind of heading, studies suggest that ADHD symptoms are not correlated in any way to IQ. However, it's almost certain that people with an ADHD nervous system use their IQs in different ways than do neurotypical people. And he says, by the time most people with the condition reach high school, they're able to tackle problems that stump everyone else and can jump to solutions that no one else saw. That is so spot on accurate. And here's the thing, the main gift of we fast mind club members is our inherent, just this natural ability for creativity and innovation. We are big sky people. And of course, um, actually it's interesting. We just did this in my cognitive psychology class a couple weeks ago and also my Minecraft class, different reasons uh, for creativity because creativity obviously has a direct do not, do not pass go or collect $200 link to problem solving. Creativity is a huge part of problem solving. So it makes sense that we are really good at this. And it's also, um, uh, it should be known, uh, ADHD years, we Fast Mind Club members tend to score very, very high on on tests that involve, diver- that measure divergent thinking, which of course is innovation. And, you know, William also next kind of mentions that to people that the vast majority of adults with with the ADHD nervous system are not necessarily 
overtly hyperactive, right, or hyperactive on the outside. I'm going to just go ahead and switch that back to high energy because I still, I definitely have the age. I've always had the age, probably always going to have the age. You know, I'll probably celebrate my 100th birthday by skydiving or something. Um, but what he says is, uh, as far as adults, adult ADHD years, is that uh, we are hyperactive internally. And that's true too. But just remember, it doesn't necessarily mean somebody's anxious. Now there's a high comorbid with ADHD, which of course means that there's a, there's a something else going on. So somebody can have both though that high energy, you know, that the high energy that kind of shows to other people is not necessarily that sometimes like myself, we're just the ever ready bunny. So next, um, William, kind of addresses the A for attention, right? Which we keep, we're keeping that one. And kind of like I said earlier, if there's one thing I'm sure about in this life, it's that I do not have a deficit of attention. You know, it's just kind of this, like a hummingbird. I'm just zip, zip, zip all over the place. And and then William, you know, kind of supports that, which is very validating for me, for sure. Those with this condition or wiring gift don't have a shortage of attention. This is absolutely true, William. Instead, they pay too much attention to everything. Most people with unmedicated ADHD have four or five things going on in their minds at once. For me, I'll tell you, that would be one quiet day. And then he says, uh, the hallmark of the ADHD nervous system is not attention deficit, but it's more like inconsistent attention. You know, and uh, even though my, my talk was called the double-edged sword, actually, it was mostly about the impulsive com impulsivity component of ADHD, though it's also true there's a double edge with the attentional thing, too, that William's talking about, because this is both, can be both a detriment and a gift as well, because the not paying attention to what we're supposed to be paying attention to certainly was an issue for me in school that you, right up through because remember nothing no treatment happened so college graduate school it wasn't until I think I was like in my mid four no maybe the late mid four like 10 years ago mid 40s I started to actually do something about it because it you know it finally occurred to me that it was real I mean I knew it and cognitively I knew it but I didn't really get you know the impact it was having on my life you know, in my, in my grades, isn't, I also had a lot going on in my family life, so I can't say it was all this, because I had a very turbulent uh, upbringing, as I think you know if you listen to previous episodes. Um, but, uh, however, my grades sort of resembled, resembled the lasagna noodle, because that's how it works with the Fast Mind Club, because we engage in what we're interested in. And, of course, as an as that's much more understandable. Not that it's understood well, because kids certainly get lots of negative. I've had lots of negative around that and teenagers. And when, however, when you get to adulthood, it just takes on a whole new, you know, layer of judgment for people because people only expect so much, you know, focus and, um, you know, from children and, and uh, teenagers and adults. And then when you get to adulthood, it's, 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 we are often viewed, it's been said to me I, a lot, it, you know, often viewed as being immature and irresponsible and reckless and all these things that just aren't true when it's just very, very hard to stay on, on task sometimes. For me, my big, my big hard thing with it was managing money. But again, I think I'm going to get to that later. You know, but even just the paying attention thing, you know, when you have to, and what does get a little uh, emphasis on a little easier is that, you know, when chronologically, when you just get older, you've been in your skin for so much longer that you obviously know yourself better and you can start to pick up when you're starting to slide or, you, you know, you can develop strategies to kind of, you know, excuse yourself from a conference and go, you know, stand up in the back or, make a million excuses to go get that third and fourth cup of tea or whatever, just so you can get up and move because sitting is overrated. I'll just tell you that right now. You know, we get a little bit better, but it's not like it goes away. ADHD does not go away. So that's one big myth that we grow out of it. No, we do not grow out of it. Like that's like growing out of having brown eyes or something. No, it's part of who we are. You know, I want to say I am ADHD 
And thankfully, I've really learned to embrace the superpower that it is because, you know, along the way, it's definitely had its challenges without question. And so obviously, you know, that the attention thing can lead to all kinds of negative you know, grades and, you know, um, you know, shifting, uh, you know, uh, out of whatever you're supposed to be doing at work and shifting into another thing. And that's challenging. Fortunately for me, I work in the most positive, fantastic environment ever, surrounded by the most amazing people ever who embrace my wild, very creative mind and actually uh, smart on their side too, because they made it work for them because they know to like, they know that it's a good idea to let me run with something because the ideas will just flood. So that's awesome. And they're also really, really, really patient when they know that I've gone off in another direction and, you know, need to be reeled back in or something. And it's, and it's never with unkindness or any kind of, you know, sometimes a chuckle, but it's in a good way. It's not in any kind of demeaning way. And this is so important um, for children, teenagers too, obviously, but with adults, it just seems like it's different because the expectations are so much higher. So it's so important to surround ourselves with people who are supportive. And it doesn't mean at our end to not take ownership because we got to do that. We got to say, and I use, you know, as I like to say when I need to, because I, I do need to sometimes that, you know, my ADHD, my wild mind is it's when I fill people in for why I missed whatever, whatever happened, it's meant it, it's, it's an explanation and not an excuse. It's an explanation and not an excuse though. Um, it's good to surround yourself with people who are supportive because then you can out yourself safe, safely. People are more understanding. And not only that, they can be supportive. They can be supportive and also um, benefit. There's the support. And then there's just, you know, benefit because we are big sky people. So if you're in a job, career calling that, uh, you know, relies on a lot of, you know, creative thinking. I mean, that's exactly who you want on that team right there is, you know, some of the, some some ADHD or some some fast minders because they're who gonna come up with the brand new novel idea, you know. And when we get in the zone, we are in the zone, like unbelievably. So that is also the kind of paradox of ADHD because we're oh you can't focus, you can't pay attention to anything. Well we well when we get into the zone, this is actually this gift is referred to as ADHD hyperfocus, and we're, when we're in that in that zone, we actually can, we're actually focusing better than neurotypicals are because we can't help it. It's kind of like, we're sh let's say shiny object chasers. And when we see that shiny object, isn't anything going to stop us from chasing it? Nothing. And so again, this is how novels get written and movies get produced. And, you know, um, jet blue, the CEO of jet blue. Okay. This is how big, big things happen when we are in the zone and, <laughs> and, uh, comically speaking, much like Cinderella, when the clock strikes midnight, we go back to being a pumpkin. So this zone is fantastic, though it does have a window. So we kind of got to we kind of got to get it done while the charge and while the shine is still there. And you know, I have to tell you, I love how William says this. I'm actually hoping I would actually love to do lunch with this guy. Just would be like really, really awesome conversation. I'd love to listen to what he has to say. Anyway, he says. People with ADHD primarily get in the zone by being interested in or intrigued by what they are doing. I call it an interest-based nervous system. I mean, look at that. See how words matter? You know, people, the world's telling you you're defective and flawed and, you know, worthless, even in some cases, and then change that around to William calls it an interest-based nervous system, not you're impulsive and immature and irresponsible and reckless, but you, you're interest-based. Isn't that amazing? And then he says, judgmental friends and family see this as being unreliable or self-serving. When friends say, you, you can do the things you like, they're describing the essence of the ADHD nervous system. Uh, you know, in fact, way back when I was therapizing, um, and I, my last stop on that train was oh, it's just so great. I, the only reason I really left is because we moved because of my my husband got a like a tra transfer sort of job situation, um, and also babies. Uh, but I worked with kids with kids with ADHD primarily. I worked with others as well, but I just kind of developed 
like a reputation for this. And so kids and teenagers with it. And I just, oh my gosh, I I was doing therapy up in trees and under coffee tables and on walks and motion, motion, because we tend to focus the best, most of us, when we're in motion. I also can't tell you how many times I've heard from parents, oh, my little so-and-so always, or most of the time he, I'm trying to think if I ever had a female ADHD client. I might have, I don't have a memory of that, but you know, that, that was just back then. That's how it was. And they would say, oh, you know, the, the teachers or whomever referred us here and my little so-and-so, I don't think he has ADHD because he can sit there and play video games for hours. Well, of course he can. He's interested. There's a lot of bling bling. There's a lot of shine with video games and it's, and it's got, and also they're, they're programmed to be addicting. And this is, you know, sort of all in the same general area of the brain. So it's no big surprise that little Johnny is having a tough time focusing in schoolwork and this and that, um, yet can play hours and hours of his favorite video game, which has rewards about, you know, every few milliseconds keeping him engaged. You know, we also like to move for the most part, right? So then Williams, Williams' um, last point for this part is he says, most people with an ADHD nervous system can engage in tasks and access their abilities when the task is urgent, when it's a do or die deadline, as he says. And um, yeah, true. He said, for, in- uh, for instance, this is why procrastination is an almost universal impairment in people with ADHD. They want to get their work done, but they can't get started unless the task becomes interesting, challenging, or urgent. You know, that is spot on accurate. Um, The only symptom out of all of them for the inattentional type, the impulsivity type, the combined type, I got them all, except this one. And I kind of chalked that up to being the proud prodigy of two alcoholic parents because I learned at a young age, you know, that I procrastination wasn't going to work for me. Like, I mean, I'm not talking about school, just in life in general, because I learned that I had to, if I wanted to get it done, I had to get it done myself, you know, things. And then when I, when we had, when my husband and I had the five kids and, you know, they, there was a really good, you know, we found this fabulous nursery school that was um, a pre preschool, but it had a lot, you know, a waiting list a mile long. So like, get, can't wait, can't wait. Can't, I just learned that young, get them on the list. Like when I'm still pregnant, do it now. So th- I think that's why, because otherwise I'd probably have that one too, because this makes good sense. This is also one of the reasons, just an ADHD fun fact, that um, the stimulant medication, um, particularly I'm thinking of Adderall because it's it works with dopamine. This can Adderall helps in a lot of ways, uh, but also it, it or, and it helps with procrastination because when the dopamine we get we have a dopamine fix when there's when we have closure whether that's cleaning a closet in the springtime finishing a paper finishing a work project finishing a to-do list with lots of stuff on it there's a dopamine fix so Adderall can really help with that um, procrastination thing because we ADHDers naturally our dopamine levels are much different so you know, it all, it also helps us to, again, an explanation, not an excuse. It helps us to, to just uh, be empathetic towards ourselves when we realize this is a brain thing. Yeah, you, know, you wouldn't judge somebody with diabetes, right? You know, they need insulin to manage that or, you know, need Adderall to be able to, um, you know, manage tasks and manage life and manage money and manage your career and manage your kids and manage school or manage whatever, uh, that the fact that it's a brain thing, I think, hopefully, helps us be a little bit more empathetic with ourselves. I didn't come into that one until about 10 years ago. And it's amazing what a difference Adderall can make, what a difference it can make. Because, um, granted, also an age difference. I got When I got my PhD or earned my PhD, you know, as a seasoned adult, so that's a little different too, but air and still it was to sit that long and the studying was obviously crazy amount of hours a day. It was just so hard. And I like to think of myself as a late bloomer because my grades weren't very good in, in, on, as an undergrad, granted partly due to my had a very turbulent home life and nowhere to live for part of it. So that was a little bit stressful. Um, though they were just like up and down, up and down. And when I went back and looked at my grades at St. Mike's as a seasoned adult, 
like I think it was right before I went into my PhD program a while ago. And they were actually worse than I remembered. And then I went through and looked at some of the courses and it was like out of an ADHD textbook or off a like a documentary or something because I'd have not so good grades in things that just bored me to tears. And then I took, I got into this metaphysics phase in philosophy. I was a pre-med major, but I just kind of got into that for a while. And lo and behold, A's ended up loving uh, music, something with Gregorian chant. We used to call it clapping for credits, go figure an A. And then, you know, uh, you know, actually, uh, Chem, uh, organic chemistry, go figure, and A, because I loved how it made sense to my head. It was like stacking Legos together. And I have a, I have a friend from St. Mike's who still says, you know, it's exactly two people who who got an A in that, and not not to blow my horn or brag, because that's not even the point, because I actually completely bombed some classes that would be considered to be easier because they just did not grab my attention. So if you mix up the A's in organic chemistry with, you know, the D's and C's, in easy, like intro to basket weaving classes, it all came out to like, you know, C average or C plus. It just, it's terrible because I wasn't engaged. And the other thing, again, when I was engaged, I did really well. The other thing is back then, remember, no accommodations. Nobody got a private room. Nobody got any kind of somebody to help organize you. Like now we have these fantastic resources um, where I teach. We have smart space. They help you organize your externally help you with your time management stuff. They're amazing. They're such good people. And back then, though I was surrounded with good people, St. Mike's is loaded with good people. It was just the times. Like there weren't, at least to my knowledge, there were no accommodations or 504s in college. It just didn't exist. And had I had a room to myself, I can only imagine because in a room with, you know, 15 to 18 other students, the pen tapper, pen tappers and the snifflers just drove me insane. I used to have to hold my, like plug my ears with my fingers, then write something, then, then plug again, then write something. And each time I would plug and, and then write plug and then write, it would take me, you know, minutes to get back, get my head back in there. Cause I'm shifting out of that train of thought and trying to get back in. And it was just, it was just not the most efficient way to learn and, you know, it beats up on your self-esteem, too. Like, when you know you can do better and you just don't, it's like, what's the matter with me? You know, what's the matter with me? It, it's it, Again, that shame thing. The shame thing is bad, 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 and toxic. You know, I like to say that shame, which, again, is that feeling of being defective or flawed or not enough in whatever way for whatever reason, is the spiritual and emotional equivalent of drinking turpentine for breakfast instead of orange juice. It's just bad. And, you know, I mean, I just had so much of it. I, I remember my, my, my dad way back when I was in high school, um, in that range of starting to think about college, I was a junior and just, you know, just saying to me, and I, and I, I can't, and I don't want to blame him for this. Again, the times people didn't, especially girls had no idea that ADHD was even a thing. They didn't really didn't acknowledge it in general that much, but definitely not for girls. And he used to say to me, oh, how are you ever going to go to college? How are you ever going to go to college? I don't, I don't see you reading. You don't read anything. You just, you never read. And the message was, what, what's the matter with you? Like, what's wrong with you? What's defective with you? And, and in that context, um, I think what he was really trying to do was motivate me. Though, obviously, you know, it doesn't, that wasn't the best way to motivate. I think, I think those were his intentions, um, which is an underlying good thing. It just wasn't, again, not the best way. And, and of course he could not have had an idea because they didn't know with girls that I couldn't get through a page, literally one page without my mind wandering out the door and around the block. And I remember having moments of being interested. I, I took a, an American history class, which, um, with this badass teacher, she had a reputation for being just really good, not mean good, but very, very, very hard. And I somehow landed, you didn't get choices back then. I landed in there with, with her, Mrs. Clinton, I think her name is. She was so intelligent and, um, and just very demanding. And I got engaged in that. I wasn't concerned about the grade. I don't even think that crossed my mind, honestly. And I was engaged till I wasn't kind of thing. And I wanted to get through a page so badly. I just got so into it. And then it was that Cinderella, you know, thing when the, 
when the clock struck, I was just out of there. So I did what I do well for this chapter and that chapter, then not so much, didn't care a lot about, you know, whatever was going on with, you know, Taft's presidency and then back up when something exciting happened, maybe with JFK and the civil rights movements. And then she had me again and then back down with something less interesting. And that's just how it works with the ADH mind because we have an interest based nervous system. I love that. And is there's just so much more to say too, because I, I really want to touch on some more about the, again, the money thing that was my own personal, that was just, has just wreaked havoc and so, havoc and so much shame and about, I want to still continue about, you know, the, really the adult world with it and how it, you know, just continues. And then, and then also there's this, there are some specifics with women in midlife because, uh, and actually Tom Brown and I were talking about that at a conference because there's so little research on, on women in, in midlife or let's say they're older, but they went through it already. Uh, because you can have, you have such a good routine down. You've really worked on your ADHD and then you hit menopause and like all bets are off all, all, all over again. Because the hormone surge just can throw us into such a spin. So there's just a lot more to talk about. So I think this is a good place to to end because we're going to do a, a part two. And so I will say thank you, Minecrafters, to listening in the United States and all over the world. And I look forward to um, having you next week. This is Kimberly Quinn signing off from Northern Vermont. Have a mindful day.